Good morning, GCU. Would you guys stand this morning? Let's worship together. the band thank you yeah well I hope you had a good weekend uh, some weekends are better than others uh, last week was a pretty difficult week for many of us uh, you probably heard that we lost a student last Monday night uh, Stephen Spellman 
passed away while working out in one of our fitness centers. Um, just an uh, unbelievable incident. Um, we're not sure why, but uh, God took him home. So I want to encourage you throughout uh, today and this week to pray for the Spellman family. Stephen Spellman was a student that we lost. He has an older brother who still attends GCU. His name is Nick. And uh, Brad and Belinda Spellman, the parents, are um, at his service this morning, starting right now. So last night was visitation, and many were there to uh, support the family and to pray for them. And so some weeks are just tough weeks, and last week was one of those. So I hope today, I hope today we will uh, lift our voices to the Lord and sing and praise his name and be grateful for who he is in our lives and that every day and every week is important. And uh, every friendship, every relationship that we have is important and given to us as a gift. So look to the people around you and smile and appreciate them and love them and care for them. Uh, even this morning while you're together, uh, know that these relationships are precious and God loves them and God loves you. And so I hope that this will be a really special day for you. So um, next Saturday night, we have a home basketball game. It's God Bless America Night. So they would really love to see you come and cheer the team on. They don't have a game all week as we prepare for a little bit of a homestand. So next Saturday night at 6 p.m. right here in the arena, that game will take place. Next Saturday morning, we have Lopes Go Local. That is uh, our partnership with Habitat for Humanity. There's a QR code on the screen. If you have not registered yet, please register. We would love to see you participate in that service project next uh, Saturday morning. Today at 2.30 in the prayer chapel, what to pray for, a spiritual formation workshop. So if you are looking for some directions, some coaching, some mentoring about how to pray, today at 2.30 in the prayer chapel. Tomorrow night, no gathering. We have a uh, scheduling conflict, so no gathering tomorrow night, so that evening is uh, free. Our speaker next week is Ashley Woolridge from um, CCV, Christ Church of the Valley. But today is Josh Watt. Josh Watt. Yeah, amen. Josh is uh, from Redemption North Mountain. Uh, he's a GCU grad. Uh, came here last year. Has a couple of his staff here who are also GCU grads. I know you guys are going to be here. So uh, Chandler and, uh, oh, my goodness, Xavier. For crying out loud, he's a brand new pastor at church. He's gonna kick me in the shins now that I forgot his name. I'm staring right at him. Anyway, I'm glad you got some staff and some friends. Oh, Aubrey's here. Goodness, I... Hey, I'm just meeting people right now. So what's your wife's name? Anna. Anna. And your baby? Dominic. Dominic. So they're graduates too. So I'm glad you guys are here. This is alumni day at GCU. <laughs> well, sort of. All right, I need to get off stage like really quick before I mess it up anymore. All right, I'm gonna read a passage of scripture for us before we sing. Psalm 108 says this. My heart, O oh God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, Higher than the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen? Let's sing together.
to peace The storm surrounding me Let it break At your name still Call the sea to still The rage in me to still Cross has 
God of wonders, your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. Cause there's no prison wall you can break through.
would you pour out your spirit of revival over your people. Come awaken us this morning, Lord. Open our eyes, God. Would you bless every student in this room, God, for the week ahead? And in their day-to-day, -day, God, would you be so near and so close to us, God? Speaking to us and walking with us, God. Come awaken your people, God. We love you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the honor and the praise, and it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, brother. How you doing? It's, let's have a revival. I would not pick me as the speaker to start a revival, I feel very humble to be in front of you again for the second straight year uh, with my wife in the audience who I love dearly. I actually met her. She was singing at a worship gathering out in the East Valley. And I said, I like that girl a lot. I'm going to marry that girl. And that's what I did. So, and she's here with our baby Ozzy. Tim, thank you. Uh, I went to GCU a long time ago. Graduate 2005. It was different back then. It was a little smaller. Uh, but there's something sweet in the atmosphere here. There's just a sweet, humble, joyful culture, whether it's Tim or students or the worship band or the tech crew, like everyone here just has a sweet aura about it. So I just appreciate you guys. I appreciate the culture you're creating. What a great uh, organization, institution, school here, GCU. But I get to speak today once again, and it's a privilege and an honor every time I get to open up the scripture in front of anyone, let alone a crowd uh, this big. And here's where I want to start us off, just with a simple question today. It's a question you've been asked a million times. It's you've been asked when you were a kid. But if you could have any superhero power, what would be the superhero power you would pick? My kids are all into Marvel. Xavier, our newest pastor at our church, is very into Marvel. I'm sure he has a long list of superhero powers. What's yours, Xavier? Okay. <laughs> to be able to make any type of food come out of his hand. That's his superhero power right there. That is awesome. That's not what I would have picked. When you open up the scriptures, Jesus asks people often when he meets them a question that sort of gets to the heart of that superhero question. Like if you could have anything in this world done to you, for you, through you. What would you want done? This is how Jesus asked that question. Whether it's a blind man or a woman with a bleeding issue, people coming to him with these major issues, here's what Jesus would often ask. He'd say, what do you want me to do for you? It's his way to give us agency and to say, what do you want? If you could have anything, what would you want me to do for you? And as I think back to my college years, my pre-Christian years, and I think about a superhero power or if Jesus met me wherever I was and said, what do you want me to do for you? I would not be able to answer it like I could now. Back then I was not self-reflective enough. I didn't have enough awareness of who I was. But looking back, here's what I would want Jesus to do for me. Here's my superhero power I would love. I would love him to take away all my insecurity. In any environment... Any situation, whether I'm with the most powerful person in the world or in a group of college buddies, there would never be an ounce of insecurity in me. That would be my superhero power. And I bet if you're honest with yourself, a lot of you are like, that sounds pretty nice. The food coming out of the hand sounds nice, but I'd love not to have any insecurity. See, insecurity is just not being comfortable in the skin God has given you. And for most of my life, all of my life before I met Jesus, I was never fully comfortable in my own skin. Whether I was successful in baseball or sports or academics, is at high school, I went to high school, big, huge graduating class, 900 students, I was popular. Like, I had the stuff you're supposed to have to be able to be secure and confident. And yet, if I was to dig down deep, I was in Secure. And I wish I had a superhero power where I could snap my fingers and say, I don't want this anymore. 
So what we're doing this morning is real simple. How do you live life without insecurity? I'm going to tell you a random Old Testament story that I bet most of you have never heard because I never heard it until I dug down deep. I want to tell an Old Testament story, but I want to talk about my insecurity, our insecurity, and how do we live life with less, possibly even no insecurity. That's what I want to do today. So first up, my insecurity. My insecurity. At our church, when people get baptized, we have them fill out this questionnaire, a testimony. You guys have heard that maybe. Uh, But one of the questions is simply, before Jesus, my life was marked by blank. And we have people say, like, what's the thing that marks your life? And I remember teaching at a men's retreat this year for our church. And I was the third speaker. I had two speakers before me and then me. And the first two speakers had crazy testimonies. Doing drugs, heroin in prison. Like, awesome testimonies. God saved me out of the... Some of you are like that. Like, you have crazy, crazy stories. I often wish... My oldest son is like, I, I wish I had a better testimony. It's kind of boring. And me, being the pastor, the third speaker of this ministry, had to just be honest and say, my test, I don't have any of that crazy stuff. Like, I have sin. I sinned a lot. I still sin a lot. In high school, I sinned a lot. In college, I sinned a lot. The way I did it is I sort of got in a, a rougher crowd, but I was the better one in that rougher crowd as a way to say, like, I'm not as bad as this turd over here. I mean, I'm better than him. I'm better than her. But I was still a sinner. But if I was to dissect my heart and look at me, what I had at the center of me was deep insecurity. Before my life had Jesus, my life was marked simply by insecurity. Insecurity. That's a lot of you. You know why I know that? Because that's me. And I see it all the time as a pastor. This like, God made you. Find your purpose, you see you. And yet we walk in here, out of here, around here with a, an uncomfortability in our own skin. That's called insecurity. And I couldn't spot it then, but now looking back, I'm like, that's what it was. And a few things have helped me see my own insecurity. One of the things is just good theology. Like I didn't grow up in the church. Some of you grew up in the church. I didn't grow up with my parents taking me to church, opening a Bible. They had a big giant Bible on their uh, nightstand that they never opened. It was just covered in dust. We never opened it. But then I become a Christian, 18, coming to GCU, end of high school, entering college. And I start to learn good theology. And one of the things I learned is that sin is far more complex and comprehensive than I had ever realized. Like I always thought of sin being doing drugs, looking at pornography, doing stuff you're not, shoplifting, cussing, all those sorts of things I thought were sin. And then you open up the Bible and sin is like this really multifaceted thing. And it starts in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve, whatever you do, enjoy everything in this entire universe except for that one tree. Please don't. And they disobeyed. They sinned. And in that moment, they're separate from a few things. There's like this fracture that enters the world, the universe, for the very first time. And instead of running towards God, their father, they run away from God. So there is a separation between man and God because of sin. But more than that, Adam and Eve now are off running. And God says, hey, where are you guys at? And immediately we see the first marital conflict. Adam and Eve start blaming each other. And now there's a friction, a fraction, a brokenness between every human being that will ever exist. No matter how close and loving you might be. There is sin that breaks even human relationships. Adam and Eve go on to have kids. And their first set of kids, one kills the other. You think your family's dysfunctional like it, we come from the same line. Why? Because of sin. But then God also says, and the ground will be cursed because of you. The entire universe is fragmented. There will be cancerous cells. There will be earthquakes. There will be floods. Even the earth that was supposed to be a blessing will work against you. That's all because of sin. But here's the thing I miss most of my life. There's also sin that happens in us. In us. Genesis said they were naked and unashamed. And then sin enters the world and immediately it says their eyes were opened and what did they feel for the very first time? Shame. And what did they do with their insecurity, their uncomfortability in their own skin? They covered themselves with fig leaves. Where does insecurity come from? It comes from sin. And I'm not saying you're insecure right now, you need to deal with that sin issue. I'm just saying as a human race, the reason any of us are uncomfortable in our own skin is because sin entered the world and that's part of the deal of living in a broken world. 
And that was me. No amount of success or performance could ever take away what started in Genesis 3. But here's the other thing that's really just opened my eyes to how insecure I am and how easy it is to stay insecure. It's my kids. I got a picture of them, I hope. I picked a good one, I think. Look at that crowd right there. That's sweet Aubrey. That's Elijah, my big dog. He doesn't smile right now because he's in those teen years. Roman, my number two. Jude, the greatest athlete ever to come out of the Watt House. And Ozzy, swaggy man there. Look at that sick chain, he says. That is just a good crew. I love being a dad. And one of my favorite things about being a dad is simply this. I got to name a few other human beings. What a gift. Elijah Michael, Roman Blaze, Jude Patton, Ozzy Manolo. That's one of the greatest gifts to be able to name another human. And here's how it happened in our house, is I would find an Old Testament story that I loved and I'd go and act it for my wife, Elijah. And I'd tell the story and she's sitting on the couch just trying to watch her show. And I'm like, I got a great story. Elijah beat the prophets of Baal. Listen to this story. Okay, we'll name our firstborn Elijah. And then I get to a story that I'm convinced this is the name I want for my thirdborn. And it's a random, I found it, I'm like, I've never heard this story before. And it's a story I wanna to tell to you this morning. It's about a guy named Micaiah. It's out of 1 Kings 22. It's on the screen there. So Israel is split. There's a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom. These two kings are working together. Jehoshaphat's in the south, Ahab's in the north. And here's what we read in 1 Kings chapter 22. Jehoshaphat said to Ahab, the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So just the picture. Two kings, should we go to battle? We're going to have some enemies coming against us. What do we do here? Let's gather the prophets. 400 prophets gather. And they say, You're going to be good. Verse seven, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord whom we may inquire? Have we talked to everyone? Is there someone else? Verse eight, and the king of Israel, this is when I fell in love with Micaiah, said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him. Why? For he never prophesies good concerning me, only evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were there prophesying before them. So it's sort of like this, but 400 people. So this set crowd here, the king's there and all the prophets saying, you're gonna win, you're gonna win, you're gonna win. And Micaiah's being brought to this moment to speak in front of 400 other prophets. And here's how the story goes. I'm not gonna read it all, it's a long story. But Micaiah comes and they say, Micaiah, what do you say? He says, go into battle, you're gonna be great, you're gonna win. And the guy knows, he's like, stop being a smart aleck. Tell us the truth. And Micaiah says, you want the truth? If you go into battle, Ahab, you will die. Your armies will be scattered. This is what the Lord has told me. Thus saith the Lord. And they slapped Micaiah across the face. And the other king said, see, I told you, he never says anything good about me. And then you read on in the story, they go off in the battle, they do not listen to the voice of Micaiah, they listen to the 400 voices, and Ahab dies in battle. And Micaiah, you never hear from again in the whole Bible. And I said, what a great name. Let's name our kid Micaiah. So we have our third born and we write Micaiah on the board in the hospital and nobody can read it. It's like, Micaiah, 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 and the name I wanted more than anything, we had to erase while my wife's still recovering there. And we named him Jude instead. But I always wanted a Micaiah. If I ever have another son, if you have a son, name him Micaiah. It means who is like the Lord. It's a great name. But how does that apply to my kids? What I wanted for my kids was this. When the moment called on, when they were called on by God or others, they would be the voice that said what is true no matter the cost. But as my kids get older, my perspective on this story has shifted. 
I don't look at Micaiah as much anymore. I look at Ahab. Because as my kids enter the teen years and middle school, and I think about them coming off to college, here's the thing that I worry more about. It's not them being able to speak what is true when they're supposed to. It's all the voices that they're going to hear and are hearing constantly cultivating and growing that insecurity that's in them, that's in all of us. Voice after voice after, this is the conversations I have as my kids come home from school. It's not, did you say the right thing when you were supposed to? It's what are they saying today? What are you hearing today? And how do you feel about what you're hearing? Ahab made a choice. I'm not gonna listen to all those voices. I'm, I'm gonna listen to the voice I wanna listen to, so I'll gather up my people. My kids don't have that. You don't have that option. You enter into a world that has lots of voices. Micaiah's life lesson, if I could write down, is be the right voice. Ahab's life lesson is this, listen to the right voice. No matter how many voices you are hearing. Now, I don't know about, I wrote this question, do you think the world you're living in now, 20 years removed from me being in college, is louder or quieter than the world I existed in? You all know the answer. Far louder, way more voices. I didn't get a cell phone until I was 22. You guys got cell phones and social media and the whole world in your hands at whatever age your parents gave it to you. And what came with that was a lot of good, but also here, all the voices of the world right before you all the time. And are they speaking life? Or are they stirring in you that insecurity that was in me? That's the question. There's this syndrome called spotlight syndrome. And it's this reality that every environment people go into, they feel like there's a spotlight and they overestimate the amount that people are noticing them, their appearance or anything about them. And they've done scientific studies and most humans deal with some variety of this. They walk in a situation, they think people are gonna notice this. And they did all these studies, they make them wear different shirts with goofy, stu goofy stuff on it and they put them in these situations and they come out and they ask people around, hey, did you notice that Josh was wearing that really stupid shirt? And the results are always the same. Nobody notices us as much as we think people notice us. That could be very depressing if you're even your best friends. But the reality is the spotlight syndrome is real. And here's what's real about the world we live in. We can't ever escape it. You go into your room to be quiet and there's still this spotlight syndrome with all the technology we have, this, this constant nagging, people are thinking stuff about me. I'm not as good, I'm not as pretty, I'm not as whatever as you think. It's just sad. There's a movie a few years back, if you have an extra hour and a half, I encourage you. It's called Eighth Grade. It's about being an eighth grade girl. And one of the best parts about the movie is the soundtrack. It's this really angsty background noise all the time as a way to sort of describe what it's like to be a young person. It's just loud and it never goes away. There's always voices, always voices. We have way more voices than the 400 voices our man in this story had, way more voices. So what do we do with this? What would I tell a young me with all that insecurity who didn't even know how to describe what was going on inside of me? What would I tell my sons? What would I tell some of you if you're like, I am crippled with insecurity? What would I tell you? Here's our only hope. I've got two things and then we'll, I'll pray us out of here. Here's the first thing. Is part of being a Christian is learning how to turn down the voices. Part of your spiritual formation, your discipleship is your ability, my ability, our ability to turn down the voices that are unnecessary and often doing more harm than good. How do we turn down the voice? I'm not telling you to go be Amish, but part of your discipleship is learning. How do I turn down the voices? One of my favorite mathematicians, the guy Blaise Pascal, he has the saying, all of man's problems come from this reality, that we are unable to sit alone with our thoughts. His point being, we're so insecure, we just distract ourselves the moment we have a quiet moment. Turn down the negative voices. Here's the other thing I'd say is listen to the right voice. Jehoshaphat said this in verse seven, is there not another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? He's like, I see this, I hear all the voices, I see what's going on here, but is there another voice that I might inquire from for you? Is there another voice that you could turn up as you turn down some of those voices? 
And I would say absolutely what I've given my life to is that the voice is found in this book here. This is how the Bible describes Jesus Christ, the God man from Nazareth. It says this in Hebrews, long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, which are these days here, he has spoken by his son. The voice that can eliminate, remove, turn down insecurity is his son, Jesus Christ. And it's there and it's available for all of us. And how does Jesus describe his voice to us? This is what Jesus would say about himself for all of us in this room. And then I'll pray us out. Jesus says this, there is a thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy, but here's why I came. That they, you all, may have life and life to the fullest. That the insecurity could be turned down, that the voice of God could be turned up by listening to his son, Jesus Christ. I know we're gonna walk out of here and there's still gonna be lots of stuff wrestling us, but I really encourage you, turn down the negative voices and help each other turn down the negative voices. And start to listen to the voice that says, I am here to bring life and life to the fullest, amen? Let's pray together. God, thank you for the college years. Thank you for GCU. Thank you for the leadership here that's created such a great environment. And thank you for all these students. I pray that they would walk out of here more sure that you have a good word for them and that your voice is life-giving and that they would be able to help each other hear your voice more and more in such a loud world. It's in your son's name we pray. Everyone said amen. Love you all. Thank you.